Yeah, I'm going to get started here. Um, I'm Dr. Norman Caulfield, for people who don't know me. I've been in the history department for more than 25 years. And um, I teach American history, Latin American history, Mexican history, and labor history. And I got involved with labor history, and that sort of evolved uh, to looking more at the economic side of things. And for the last old decade or so, I've been really um, getting into that, and, and lately uh, into how the financial sector works. But this topic is very relevant. I think everybody is sort of aware that there's a trend in the economy right now, and it doesn't seem to be ebbing any, and that is the creation of part-time jobs rather than full-time jobs. And so today, that's what I'm going to talk about. And I'm just not going to bombard you with statistics about how many part-time jobs there are in the economy. I'm going to go over some of that stuff. But more importantly, I want to talk about why this is going on. And the first thing we're going to establish is that it is a long-term trend. It's not something that's just recent. In recent years, it has accelerated. But this trend really goes back to the late 1960s, as you'll see. Now, what I have up here are a series of graphs and charts. And uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through those. But before I get into that, I'm going to start talking about you know part-time work and how all this started and how it really took off. Um, let me move to the first slide. This is uh, the growth of part-time jobs, and as you can see, it begins really, and this is from the Federal Reserve of St. Louis, it begins way back there, oh gosh, around 1967, 68, and here it is in 2013, so you can see that th this growth is continual. Uh, and of course, if you look at the 1990s, uh, right here there's a big, sharp uptick okay, to part-time employment. And uh, what's going on in the 1990s? I remember uh, in the 1990s there was a joke going around. 21 million jobs were created. Somebody approached the guy and said, hey, did you hear about the 21 million jobs that have been created this decade? And he goes, absolutely, my wife and I have four of them. <laughs> so, I mean, that's really when it starts. Now, why does it start then? Well, a big reason is that this is when you start to see the economy uh, become very financial in its orientation. In other words, a financialization of the economy. Uh, and debt becomes more important as something that promotes great growth. Uh, we see the uh, uh, repeal of Glass-Steagall in the late 1990s. Uh, you probably have heard about that uh, if you pay attention to this kind of stuff at all. Uh, that was a piece of legislation that was enacted during the early years of the Great Depression by the New Deal, and it separated investment banking from retail banking. And of course, uh, it was uh, basically abrogated, uh, I think, in 1998, 99. Uh, and there was other uh, forms of deregulation uh, in the financial industry that occurred at the same time. So uh, one of the things that is very peculiar about this is that you, you see then it takes off in 2000 and from 2000 to the present and we're going to see this as I move through these charts uh, we don't really have much job creation at all in fact we have a whole decade of uh, net zero job creation from 2000 to 2010 so what, why is this going on and what does uh, the financialization of the economy have to do with it. So, you know, I, I keep up with a lot of this research, and there's a woman, her name is Catherine Austin Fitz, and she has this website and this company, actually, because people pay her for information. That's how good she is. It's called Solari.com. Well, anyway, she has a, a, a pretty good uh, understanding of this, Meaning that she goes back to this period that I'm talking about and she says there was a conscious decision in the 1990s and NAFTA has something to do with this and subsequent free trade agreements, which I'll get into a little bit later. But she, she basically says that 
The decision was made to offshore what she calls the old economy. The old economy would be manufacturing-based. Uh, uh, and the new economy would be uh, debt-based, essentially, and finance and services, okay? And the growth of the service sector has a lot to do with this story as well, and we're going to get into that. Also, so what was left over from the old economy? Well, she says what we have is the creation of a lot of people who are dependent upon the government. you got food stamp programs, unemployment benefits, uh, welfare, all of these programs, Social Security, Disability, uh, all, all of these uh, numbers and all these programs I just mentioned have went up substantially, uh, particularly in the last four or five years, okay? So uh, she calls this the legacy economy, okay? Now, what does that mean uh, with regard to what I'm talking about? What it really means is that this legacy economy has created a lot of people who don't work, okay? So the labor force participation rate is uh, at a low right now, going back to, well, 1978, the lowest rate since 1978, and that was a period of what they call stagflation, which was high unemployment and inflation, okay? So th that's where we're at, and, I'm, and I'll have those slides up there. But, you know, another story I want to tell within the story, getting back to the offshoring the economy, and Austin Fitz says, well, that was like a $94 trillion project, okay? And, and basically now the legacy economy's left and they want to sweep that away. That's her contention. But the industrial base is very important uh, in understanding this. How do, how do we get rid of the industrial base? Where does it go? Well, one of the places it goes to is China. Well, you know, before all of this started happening, and, and we can go back, and we're gonna see this. I got another chart up there with manufacturing. Before all this happened, uh, you know, we were a country that, you know, produced things and sold things, and people earned wages and they saved money, and we had this business cycle um, that worked pretty well. Sure, business cycles, you have upswings, you have downswings. One of the things I'm gonna talk about today is that this is all broken now. It's broken just like it was back in the Depression. I'm going to explain that. I'm talking about the Great Depression in the 1930s. But China has a big industrial base now. And guess what? Part-time jobs in China are unheard of. Okay. And, and so you go back to our era of industrialism. I worked in industry. And, you know, manufacturing to this day is not part-time. It's full-time. Uh, so why is that? Well, Henry Ford, you know, he paid his workers five dollars a day, and the story is so they'd have enough money to go out and buy the Model Ts that were rolling up assembly line. But that, that's true. But there's another reason. You want a stable workforce in manufacturing. You don't want a high turnover rate. And he was experiencing that back then. He figured out, well, I need to have a stable workforce, which means I have to pay these people some money. Okay. You can't turn labor over all the time in a, in a factory like, like auto production and, and expect to get things done. It's just not going to happen. you gotta, you got to keep tra training and retraining people. Your business is going to fail. So what do we do? We shift to finance and service. Service sector jobs, uh, you know, are different. They can be broken up into halves, quarters. And, and, and this is very important in terms of understanding the shift to part-time work. So it, it, it's long-term and it's accelerated in recent years. Uh, you know, if we look at <laughs> the, the monthly jobs report, I'm going to talk about the one here that came out last Friday, uh, we'll understand that, well, what jobs are kind of being created? Well, they're in low-wage sectors uh, and they're in non-tradable services. Okay, uh, our job re jobs reports over the last several years resemble jobs reports from India about 40 years ago. Basically, you got low wage service sector jobs being created, and they're part time more so. Okay, so that that's really what's going on. Okay, 
Now, the other thing that's going on, as all of this starts in the 90s, who was appointed as Federal Reserve Chairman? Alan Greenspan. Who succeeded him? Ben Bernanke. Who's going to see Ben Bernanke? We don't know yet. But the thing is, this is when we start having more of a planned economy, okay? And, and we move away from these business cycles. And uh, in fact, what was going on in the 90s uh, with all the job creation, they were saying, well, we're going to have permanent job growth and we won't have these business cycles anymore. Because the Federal, what did the Federal Reserve do? Well, <laughs> they basically are, did back then what they're doing today. They started printing money. And of course, they lowered interest rates. But more importantly, much of the economy was offshore. So what did that mean? It means there wasn't any real wage inflation. You know, you could, you could export uh, manufacturing activity to China and Mexico and other countries, so you, so you don't have real wage growth uh, to deal with if, if you're planning an economy. You know, and, and for those of you who doubt it, you know, I mean, you look at China, that's one side of the coin of a planned economy. You look at the U.S., China, there are no part-time jobs. You have industrial production. Uh, from everywhere in the world, not just factories from the U.S., but from other places in the world move there as well. So you have a planned economy over there, and, and by the way, wages have been suppressed since the really 1970s, but really in a big way since the year to, around the year 2000. We're going to see that as well. Uh, wages as a share of GDP has really went down. And so where does the money go that they print? Well, it goes into speculation. That's why the stock market went up in the 90s. It went up, and well, there was a bu bubble burst, dot com bubble burst. But but since then, what have we had since the 90s? We've had all these speculative bubbles that are really that, that's the only growth we can talk about. I'm going to talk about GDP growth and how that slowed down, and compare it to GDP growth, for example, uh, uh, you know, right after World War II. It's it's there there is no comparison really, as we're going to see. But uh, th this, is, this is an important development. That is this financial engineering where you suppress inflation. And in fact, what you're doing is you're creating deflation. You're taking more money out of the real economy and you're putting more money into the financial sector, which becomes increasingly parasitic, meaning that it, com it, it increasingly needs to feed off of the real economy to speculate and to create these structures called derivatives. And derivatives, uh, Deutsche Bank, for example, right now is the example being thrown out there uh, as, well, this is the new Lehman Brothers because they have all these derivatives on their book and there's no way that they can match up with them in the end. And so if there's going to be another major financial collapse and, and a bank that triggers it, Many experts are saying Deutsche Bank uh, will be the one that triggers this. So this is what's going on, all right? Now, all of this basically um, points to the most recent jobs report, which is uh, pretty poor, 169,000 jobs created in August, but there were downward revisions for uh, July. Uh, July there was 162,000 and they revised July down to 104,000 and the jobs of course are in the low wage service sectors. Uh, you know, a good idea might be to go to bartending school or something. But then again, you can only be a part time bartender. Um, sectors that are actually hiring are of course, you're looking at part time workers at low wages. And the number of part-time workers for economic reasons, uh, actually, they declined a little bit this last month, but they have, that's been growing because, you know, you can work part-time by choice, but if you're working part-time for economic reasons, that means you can't find a real job, okay, that, that, that is full-time and pays wages. Now, recently, uh, a former director of the Bureau of Labor Statistics, his name is Keith Hall, and he's now with uh, George Mason University. 
Uh, and he did this little analysis, he was on TV and this made the news media. Uh, before August, uh, he said that basically 97% of the jobs created just this year were part-time. That's huge. Uh, so he, he, he got on TV and he talked about the decline of more permanent, better paying jobs uh, and he points to the declining labor force participation rate for men uh, who have traditionally been employed in higher paying sectors such as manufacturing. Now, uh, also, you have to remember these sectors have over the past decade been brought into competition with wages in the service sector. But anyway, the participation rate of men fell to 69.5%. This is the lowest level since the government began collecting these kinds of records back in 1948. So the male population is participating in the labor force at a rate of 69.5%. Back to 1948. The participation rate for women, which rose steadily throughout the 20th century, and, and this is uh, something that I need to comment on here, the, so as the service sector grows and you get more part-time employment, you see more female labor participation. But even that now is beginning to trend downward. So the participation rate for women, which rose steadily throughout the 20th century, continues to decline. And of course, uh, uh, it's at 57.3%. So citing this BLS household survey, and the, and the jobs report is made every month on the basis of two surveys. One is the establishment survey, the other is the household survey. The establishment survey doesn't tell you anything about part-time work. It's the household survey. And those are phone calls. And, and the phone calls consist of a series of questions that they ask the person on the other end of the line. So they call them up and, and they ask them questions if, if they've been looking for work, or if they have work, what kind of work it is, part-time, whatever. But um, in uh, the past six months, more people were reporting that they were employed uh, 963,000 but 936,000 of them reported they were in part-time jobs. So that calculates to about 97%. Hall continued that it is a really high number for a six-month period. I'm not sure that has ever happened over six months before. So he was on uh, Fox's Your World television program. He argued that the real employment rate actually was significantly higher than the official number. Remember, this guy used to be the... <laughs> head of the Bureau of Labor Statistics, so he knows what he's talking about, okay? So he says, uh, of course he couldn't do this when he was in that position, but he's doing it now. He's making these statements. He says uh, that the official number, which is today 7.3%, is at least three percentage points higher. He says, while 11.2 million people are now considered officially unemployed, Hall said a more realistic number was around 18 million. He prefers to use the employment ratio, and the employment ratio, we're gonna have that chart up here too, shows the uh, proportion of the population that has a job. That number fell from 63% before the recession, started in December 2007, to 59.4% uh, when the recession officially ended in June of 2009. Since that time, it has fallen even further since 2009, 58.7%. Of course, further distorting this picture is the fact that people who work part-time are counted as employed. Okay. They have a job, but what, what is the job? What's the quality of the job? What's it pay? Does it have any benefits, etc.? So Hall commented on this show, so a smaller percentage of the population is now working, yet the unemployment rate went from 10% down to 7.6 percent. That's a problem. So he says there are about 8.2 million workers who are working part-time jobs because they cannot find full-time employment. <coughs> and of course um, we're talking about temporary staffing agencies, um, we're talking about retail, restaurants, home health care. All this accounts for about 45 percent of all new jobs. 
Altogether, 61% of new jobs created this year have been in low paying industries. Middle income jobs account for 22%, while high paying jobs accounted for less than 17%. Now let me talk a little bit about growth. And when I get done with all this, then I'm gonna start moving through the slides and add more information and, and refer back to what I've been saying. Uh, really, the U.S. today uh, is only able to achieve a growth rate only one-sixth of the post-World War II average. In the past, a U.S. growth rate of 3% or 4% was considered very modest. Today, uh, they would be at the Department of Commerce in Washington, D.C., if they had 3 or 4% growth, they'd be breaking out the champagne bottles. Okay? If you go back to the, the decades following World War II, this would be considered very modest growth at best. And anything considered under 3% would be considered weak. A growth rate below 2% is what we have right now, was deemed to be disastrous. You know, if you had growth rate below 2%, now it's like, hey, we're at 2%, let's have a party, you know. <laughs> but, but where is, you know, what, we might say, well, wait a minute, the stock market's going up, you know, it feels better, and that's what Bernanke and Greenspan their whole theory is when the stock market goes up, everybody will feel what you call the wealth effect. They'll go out and spend money. That will stimulate the economy. But uh, what, what does this really signify? What's it mean? The fact that the U.S. economy is able to achieve a growth rate just one-sixth of the post-World War II average really indicates that deep structural changes have taken place within the American con economy and nothing approaching the previous growth rates uh, will not be seen again, as what many people are saying. Uh, there's a, uh, another newspaper, I know this is a Times talk, but there's another newspaper that I read besides the New York Times called The Financial. There was an article in The Financial Times written by this commentator named Robin Hardy, published back in July 24th, and the title of it was this, uh, Corporate Investment, A Mysterious Divergence. The article noted that there was an increasing disconnect between the level of profits and the rate of investment. I'm getting into talking about this broken business cycle. This is very decisive because in the final analysis, investment, the purchase of new plant and equipment, and the hiring of new workers to increase production is really the key driver of the expansion of a capitalist economy. The article that Harding wrote, noted that up until the 1980s, the late 1980s, profits and net investment had tracked each other, both recording about 9% of GDP. But after that time, the late 1980s, the figures began to diverge, with the gap widening, widening significantly after 2009. Now, pre-corporate tax uh, excuse me, uh, pre-tax corporate profits are at record highs. We've heard about this. Amounting to 12% of GDP. But net investment is barely 4% of output. So, so you're thinking, you go back, it's 9%, and now it's down to 4%. Now, think about this. Harding says, this is despite the fact that the cost of equity capital is low. Okay, I'll get into that. Interest rates are also low. That's due to the Federal Reserve. Increased profits are not, but increased profits are not being used to expand production, as took place in the past. What are they used for? Then? Well, being used to finance stock buybacks. In addition, they can take these profits and add money that they can borrow from the Federal Reserve. Apple has done this. Other companies have done this. And what can they borrow money for? 0.25%. Okay. And so what do they do? Well, they use that money and they buy stock, buy, well, they do stock buybacks. So what do they do? They increase the re rate of return to the shareholders. But they also, of course, are gaining from that speculation. So they buy the stock back with 
zero percent interest almost and in whatever profits they're making and then they flood the market again and the stock goes up they pay dividends everybody wants to buy it and it goes up and then they add that to their balance sheets that's one reason why corporate profits are so high and that's another reason why they're not being invested back into the real economy okay? and if you followed this at all it's in the news a lot well corporate Profits are an all-time high. Going back to the 1920s, actually. Going back to the Warren Harding administration. So, so what's, why aren't they hiring? See? Well, why would you want to risk money? They call it uncertainty if you can get guaranteed money with no risk. Right? You're not taking any risk because you're, t you're borrowing money with the backup of the Federal Reserve. So you're not taking any risks. So this is risk-free. So I'm saying that, you know, this uh, Treasury Secretary of Guyana, three years ago, he goes to Washington, D.C. for this meeting of American, that is, uh, the American is uh, the Latin America, United States, Canada, meeting of uh, Treasury Department secretaries. And he says, we don't have markets anymore. What we have are interventions. And, and he was right. His name was Chris Powell. And, and that's, this story I just told you reflects that greatly. So what do we have here? So under that were once normal conditions, increased profits would lead to greater investment, higher production, and an increase in wages, leading to an expanding market. Today, however, wages are falling as a share of GDP. So the result indicates that rising profits are no longer being produced by an expansion of the so-called market as they were in the past, but are increasingly the result of cost cutting as firms raise their bottom line by grabbing an increased share of a stagnant or contracting market from their rivals. In other words, the once normal process of capitalist accumulation, increasing investment leading to an expanding market, higher profits, and further investment, meaning higher wages, all of this is completely broken down. And I might add this, that it's not just broken down here in the United States, it's broken down in much of the rest of the developed world. The UK has a huge problem with this. They also are growing more part-time jobs, almost like the United States is, okay? France is doing the same thing. Uh, Germany to a lesser extent because they still do a lot of manufacturing and export, but they reform their labor laws. So let me uh, move through these slides and we'll talk a little bit more. Uh, this shows you here part-time for economic reasons, all industries. There we go, 2000 again, starts going up. I said all this starts, you know, really in earnest back then, at the tail end of the Clinton administration. Not in labor force wanting a job. Where does it start? Year 2000. Okay. Civilian labor force participation rate. Well, we go back to 1990. It goes along pretty good until about 2000. Of course, these gray lines represent recession. We have a definition of recession, that's two consecutive quarters of negative growth. But we really don't have a technical definition, definition excuse me, of a depression. See, and Keynes came up with one, John Maynard Keynes, and he said, well, it's, you know, so many consecutive quarters or years or period of time uh, where we have uh, underperforming trend line economic growth. In other words, what we're having now would be considered a depression uh, by John Maynard Keynes if he were alive. Employment to population ratio. Well, this starts actually, you know, going down in 2006 to a big degree. What does that mean? It's like, well, you know, you you've got more population coming in, and you say, okay, what? Well then, why isn't uh, you know these jobs? Why is the unemployment rate falling? Well, it's because 
people are dropping out of the labor market. There aren't jobs. And if you're out of the labor market for more than one year, they're not even counted as being dropped out of the labor market. So the labor force participation rate is key. And we're at the lowest level now since 1978. OK, average duration of unemployment. This goes back to the 1940s. Once again, I mentioned the gray shaded areas are those of recessions. And so, but, but if you look, we have a steady upswing from that time all the way up to today. Now it's ticked down a little bit, but what does that have to do with anything? What it has to do really is with is that people are dropping out. Uh, they exhaust their unemployment benefits or whatever, they drop out of the labor market. So who's counted, basically, is what the deal is. Who's counted as long-term unemployed? Say, there's still a lot of long-term unemployed, but there's less and less of them uh, as we go along because these people drop out of the labor market. When they drop out of the labor market, then the unemployment rate goes down a tick and everybody goes, well, I guess we're on the road to recovery. Break out the champagne. Now, this is a really interesting graph in our chart here. Rather. Age group. And the minuses represent, this is the uh, change in employment to population ratio. And the blue represent men, the red represent women. So and the age groups are down here. What this shows you is that older people <laughs> are more likely now to keep working instead of retiring. Their labor force participation rate's going up. But if you look down on the other end, younger people, their labor force participation rate is going down. Okay. Hmm. Now, well, what does this mean? It means, you know, well, pensions are in a crisis. They're part of that legacy economy that Catherine Austin Fitz talks about. You know, and so, 401ks, we as professors probably do pretty well compared to most people out there with, with this sort of arrangement because we're, we're benefiting from uh, the Federal Reserve inflation. Of course, they're fighting deflation, they say, but what they're doing is actually causing more deflation because they're sucking more and more money out of the real economy so that speculators can speculate. Now, you know, how much money do you want exposed in the stock market? How much of your pension fund do you want in there? That's up to an individual, you know. But, but if you believe Greenspan and Bernanke, you can make money if you're slick enough, I guess. But everybody else is, you know, we're kind of in there. Uh, but there's a lot of people who haven't benefited, more than who have benefited. So, let's... Uh, Zero jobs. There was zero net job creation in the first decade of the new millennium compared to healthy job growth in each of the previous decades. And you have near 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. And of course you can see it starts going down. 70s we had recessions, we had stagflation as I mentioned earlier. But you look at the 80s and the 90s and the 2000s, uh, it's pretty bleak. Can yes. I ask a question? Um, do we know? Well, I'm going to take questions at the end. I'm sorry. Okay. Well, that's all right. I, you can be the first one. <laughs> so, but I want to get through this. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. Uh, what what time do we have? It's 12:35. Oh, okay. We're at, we have plenty of time. We will uh, quit about quarter till ten till, and then we'll have all the questions and answers you want. Here's the job growth. This is the uh, private sector, just in the private sector over the previous decade. So you go all the way back to 1949 to, this is, goes up to May 2009. And so you go to 1985, <laughs> late 1980s, this, start, this starts trending down quite a bit, private sector growth yeah. of jobs. Oh. Here's a great chart. I love this one. I remember I left Ohio. I worked in Akron, Ohio. 
And the Firestone plant I worked in shut down. Worked there for six years, and I moved to Houston, Texas. I started going to college part-time. And, you know, you get in discussions with people, and they would say, oh, well, you know, we, America don't need these jobs where you get dirty. You know, we're, we're going to have high-tech jobs for everybody. We're going we're to do this. The information age is here. You need to, don't major in history, major in computer science. That, that's, that's the future. High-tech information. Well, guess what happened? Look at this. Well, you know what happened? That was part of the offshoring of the economy, okay? Just like manufacturing. So the hope was, hey, you know, I had my hands dirty, you know, I built tires. I could see that, you know, my fellow employees, they, they bought those tires and put them on their vehicles and they drove around, spent money and all that. And I said, well, we don't need that anymore. You know, high tech. So this is what's happened to that. Oh, this is actually even more favorite for me. <laughs> Getting a job is so 20th century. <laughs> All of you are familiar with Thomas Friedman of the New York Times. Well, he's not here today to defend himself, so I'm going to take it easy. <laughs> but he recently wrote a column, I can't remember, months back. And the title of the column was this. And of course, what he advocated was start your own business. This is what the 21st century is all about. It's about innovation. It's about entrepreneurialism. Okay. I mean, uh, and that's, you know, not only spoken by him, but there's others who advocate that as well. Well, these are the facts. Okay. These are, these are people starting up their own job. Self-employment is a share of non-farm employment. And by the way, all this stuff's from the Federal Reserve, so it's not out of some far out publication. These are the facts. Okay. And I might add it's getting worse. Okay. So, you know, if you look at the birth and death model, that you can go on a BLS website and look at all that stuff and and you'll see that it's actually even getting worse recently. Yeah, you have people like Thomas Friedman saying, you know what, I agree with him. Getting a job is so 21st, 20th century because you can't get a job and you can't start up your own business either. Okay. In fact, in a book that I'm finishing up, uh, one of the subtitles in one of my chapters is Thomas Friedman's title, Getting a Job is So 20th, 20th Century. And as I said before, who needs dirty jobs, right? I used to get my hands dirty. I used to get rubber and my fingernails and stuff. Well, who wants that? You know, this is in manufacturing. This is where we're at. It's ticking up a little bit. That's because wages in manufacturing are going down. We're insourcing some jobs. Okay, but it's not going to go that far. Boston Consulting Group says, "Oh, it's going to go like gangbusters," but I have my doubts because. Um, first of all, there's only going to be so much. Right now what we have is transportation costs factoring in. But once you get this market down where it's not a consumer market like Henry Ford wanted to be, then, then transportation costs are going to factor back in. See? And then, then you're going to have to either lower wages some more or move the factory somewhere else. But this is, this is where it's at. And this goes back to 1930. You can see the apex of it was like 1970, uh, 1980. That's when I left Akron, Ohio, and uh, and it's been going down ever since. Okay, hours worked. Well, this is kind of down, <coughs> and this goes back to uh, really around 1998, 2000. Starts really trending downward. Well, you know what this means, if you work fewer hours, you make less money. The consumer economy, we have 70% is based on it. Well, that means that people don't have purchasing power. Okay. But that real economy, as I said earlier, matters less and less and less. What matters is financial speculation. Okay. Some have called it the phony economy, and then you got the real economy, which is kind of experiencing rot. 
Burger flippers. Okay. <laughs> this is uh, 2009. The share of employees in low wage work in these are countries. You notice the USA and UK and Canada are right up there on top. As I said earlier, they're doing part time jobs too. I, th I guess in the UK they're flipping fish and chips <laughs> instead of burger. They got Burger King. Well, Burger King is a British company. But you go to college, you get the first two years, you throw the burgers on the grill, that's what you learned, and the last two years you flip the burgers. <laughs> This is also one of my favorites. Debt! Oh, don't worry, we got credit for you. You know, uh, we got payday loans. We got pay cards now. Uh, if you work a low-wage job like McDonald's or Walmart, uh, you don't have a bank account that they put money into, so they give you a pay card, which is owned by J.P. Morgan or something, something else. So they put, put your pay card in the ATM and it deducts fees for getting the money that you earned out. Okay. But credit cards and of course most importantly lately we have the important demographic uh, student debt. Okay. Uh, that is really some, that, that, that's another program for Times Talk. Somebody could do a whole program on student debt. But then they they would say, okay, we got to quit college, and Florida State would be very unhappy. But tuition here is low enough. Other places it isn't. Wages as a share of GDP. Here we go. Well, you, you don't make enough money. Walmart has a payday loan, and they'll charge you 36% interest to their employees. Well, that's nothing. In the UK, the, the biggest payday loan company is this outfit called Wonga, and they only charge 5,000% interest. So, you, you know, all of these things add up. And, you know, wh what has been the trend in wages here since the beginning of the downturn in 2008? Well, wages have went down, real wages. So, uh, and they keep going down. So expect this trend to continue. Wages according to sector. Well, people say, a lot, I hear this a lot, well, we don't need government jobs, and we are eliminating government jobs, lots of them. 300,000 teachers have lost their jobs since 2010. Okay. Uh, so here we got all employees, and here we have this private sector employee. Well, the private sector is supposed to be creating jobs. They have all these benefits uh, of free money. They should be investing it, but as I said before, they're not investing. They're speculating with it. Okay. So wages according to sector are going down for everybody, not just government employees, but more so even in the private sector. Need to work harder. I hear that a lot. <laughs> Gee, you can work as a janitor for 30 years, and you're going to work pretty hard. You're going to clean toilets, you're going to mop floors, but what does hard work mean? Yeah. Does that mean you're going to be rich? Does that mean you're going to make it? Okay. Productivity is the red line here. Or excuse me, the, the uh, yellow line, I'm sorry. Average income of the top 1% is the red line. And then, of course, the average overall wages is the blue line. So wages have been stagnant according to this. And this goes back to 1979. That's what it's true. Do unions matter? Well, we got to get rid of you. They've already gotten rid of unions. Look at this. Okay, unions are gone. I hear people tell me, "Well, they got to really get rid of the unions before we have any growth." Well, the union membership has been going down, and growth has been going down too. So, is there a relationship? So, 1950 to 2010, it's actually down uh, worse now. This goes to 2010. It's down to less than 8% of the private workforce and about 12% of the total workforce, meaning public employment. <coughs> Workers' rights. Correlation between strike levels and wealth concentration. Uh, here we have the red line income share of richest 1%. Again, then we have percentage of work time lost due to strikes. It's going way down, so the unions have been striking a lot, right? And 
they're causing lots of problems. So union membership is down, strikes are down. Yet, what we've showed you previous to this is that we don't have any growth. So the question has to be asked, are unions really the problem? Now, income inequality, all of this is a big issue. And the Occupy Wall Street movement, that kind of, there were a lot of themes in that, but the larger theme, arching over all of it, was income inequality. And guess what? We're in first place. This is a genie, this is from the OECD. Uh, these are the OECD countries. Uh, OECD countries, I think there's 24, 25, and they got the US and the UK. The US is in the lead. Gini coefficient zero is absolute equality. Okay. And then the higher you go up from zero means that you have more inequality. That's a measurement used by statisticians to look at how societies function. Uh, what is the inequality problem in certain societies? Well, the US, as you can see, has been going up since 1975. And also our allies, although, you know, they, uh, the parliament voted, now they want to want to try to sell it again. The parliament voted, no, we're not going to intervene in Syria. They, they turned David Cameron back. But you know, in, in Great Britain, they have a tradition of debating. Uh, we used to have one, but I think debate in this country has been kind of shut down in a way. You know, we, we don't, uh, you go in a pub over in London, right, and you go into a pub and you'll get arguments with people about politics and you know what in the end if people get up in the end they say okay let's drink another beer <laughs> here everybody goes, oh I can't I can't stand it I can't stand being opposed or I can't stand this disagreement it just hurts my ear oh I can't stand it you know th this is this is what's going on now I'm done so questions can begin yeah you my neighbor <laughs> professor Levy <laughs> I better have a good one, huh? <laughs> well, I um, thought you did. You yeah. probably forgot it, though. All right, my question is this. You're yeah. talking about Americans don't want to get their hands dirty. And I was wondering, what would be the impact on these statistics by the increase in percentage of laborers that are undocumented and uh, immigrant laborers that are coming into the country who are doing the dirty jobs? Well, I've seen estimates that, you know, a lot of this has changed in recent years, mind you, because deportations have increased and there's been a, a, a reversal of migration, particularly back to Mexico, because of the lack of opportunities here. Uh, in the early 2000s, this is when you really see uh, many immigrants coming to the United States, particularly to Mexico and Central America and other places. But, but that's, that's been curtailed. Now, they work. Uh, in getting their hands dirty, as you say, and they contribute significantly to what GDP there really is. That, that is in a real economy. They're not. They're not managing hedge funds. Okay, so 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 they are getting their hands dirty. But there is a reverse migration, and the Obama administration has more deportations on its record books than all their presidents combined. Okay. So does that satisfy you? I, I just I asked because I was thinking that maybe the the Bureau of Labor Statistics wouldn't include those statistics. Oh, you mean those people and the statistics? People. Yeah, because how do you survey them? Well, th there's establishment surveys. Okay, there, there's two surveys: there's an establishment survey and there's a household survey. And the people they call up, they don't they don't know who they're calling. They don't know if they're illegal or legal. They're just, they're just doing a sampling, okay? So those people could be included in the sample. They don't call up these people and say, are you uh, a card-carrying resident alien or are you a citizen? They don't even ask those questions, okay? They're just interested in whether or not they're working and if they're not, how long have they been looking for work or if they're not looking for work, that's, that's all. So yes, many of those people now, if you speak another language, that might be, but they have interpreters. I mean, there are people who do these surveys at the BLS who speak Spanish, so I'm sure that, that those people are included, so hopefully that answers. Any other questions? Or?
Yeah. <coughs> I think we'd all agree we had a pretty stagnant economy. Okay. And there's a lot of the charts to prove. Yeah. <laughs> and we've got a lot of money sitting on the sidelines. And I understand why these companies are a little hesitant to invest because as you said, you know, they're they're uh, they're making money and uh, there's so much uncertainty in the world. China and Asia uh, continues, like you said, to have full-time employment or, or a lot of full-time employment. Do you see them down the road kind of looking and taking the same course as what the UK and what we have taken? Not for a long time. Because the center of world capitalism has basically shifted to Asia. And it's not leaving anytime soon. That's my assessment. But going back to this uncertainty, and this is the excuse thing. Yeah, I know. Okay. For those in my contemporary America class that are in attendance today, you know that we've been talking about this because we go back to the Great Depression, and I said three things, and one of them was uncertainty. Why, why, did, why did that business cycle stop then? So you see, that happened then like it did now. What I explained earlier, that article by Robin Harding, that happened back then. Okay. That was the excuse that was given. But see, we have something, in the 1920s was all about financial speculation too. We had an industrial base though, but, but wages were stagnant like they are now. Right. But we don't have an industrial base anymore. Okay. The service sector is, is bigger, right? much bigger. The financial sector is much bigger as, as a percent of GDP. So wages as a share of GDP are down, but, but that, that's, they're not going to take that money and invest it yeah. and, and, and for, for because there's a real separation between the planned economy, the Federal Reserve, and the real economy, okay, where, where markets are supposed to function. We've created our own monster here. <laughs> well, as, as I said, you know, you mentioned China. China's got a planned economy, too. But what are they doing with their planning vis-a-vis -vis what we are doing? Our planning is based on financial speculation. Do you see it turning or changing, or at least our con uh, the direct? I mean, well, what, as long as you've got a, as long as you've got a take? revolving door. I was listening to a program this morning on television. This journalist, Greg Palas, I don't know if you know who he is. He came up with this. He, he found this leaked document. Larry Summers is supposed to be Bernanke's successor. Um, he he and Tim Geithner back in the 90s basically planned all this deregulation. And not only did the United States, they wanted everybody else in the world to follow. And they did. You know, most of the world did. So, so, you know, who was Tim Geithner? Well, both, who was Larry Summers? Both of them have been Treasury Secretaries, okay? Uh, this is a revolving door, okay? Now, there, there, there's a, a guy who used to be the Assistant Secretary of the Treasury during the first Reagan administration. His name is Paul Craig Roberts. I, I encourage everybody to read him. He's very, very smart. He's insightful. Instead of the father of Reagan, Reaganomics, he said what we have since this deregulation, we have crony capitalism. Okay? And so that revolving door, that's what I'm referring to. That's crony capitalism. And, and, and you know, you've got your legislative branch of the government and the executive branch of government. They all have to get elected. Who gives them the money? Who are they representing? So until you, you figure that out, how to break that cycle, this is going to go on forever. Okay? So that, that's my opinion. Now, we might wake up some morning and, you know, everybody will have a change of heart, but I doubt it. Any other questions? I saw some other hands up here. Yeah? How much of an effect, if any, has the increased cost of bed providing benefits for full-time employees come into play uh, saying you can't a, afford this anymore? Well, that's a good question. That, that is a motivating factor. And it has been uh, for a long time. Like health benefit uh, costs. Well, yeah. If you're an employer and you have service jobs, like I said, service jobs are 70% of the economy, but you can divide those up and split them up. Okay? And, and you know, retail, how many retail 
companies provide health insurance. Traditionally, they don't even do that. Okay, they don't provide pensions either. And, and you know, so a lot of people have been uh, have blamed Obamacare or the Affordable Care Act. But you know what? It's, it's been a trend for a long time. Maybe the Affordable Care Act has contributed somewhat to it. But they, they actually pushed the rule that required employers to provide health insurance or pay a fine. They pushed that forward to 2015. They did not just recently. So, but things keep rolling along, so it doesn't matter. Anyway, that's a good question. Yes, sir. So, uh, what would you say is the root cause of what needs to be changed to, you know, prevent this from continuing? And I guess the short answer, because I know that there's, there's tons and tons of reasons, but what do you think the main reason is? The main reason for what? For the for all these problems? Yeah, for the increase in unemployment. Did you hear what I told him? Say it again, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'll do it. <laughs> who who runs things? Did, did you get that? Yeah, yeah, I got that. Yeah. Well, well then. If they're entrenched, like I like I say they are, and many others agree with what I'm saying, and I, I, you know, I'm not the only person in the world who thinks like this. Uh, how, how do you how do you break that? Well, you say, well, we have elections, we have democracy. Well, what do those elections do? Who do they elect? Yeah. What choices do you have? You see. We're going further, uh, I mean, now, now you have stream forces where well, corporations can contribute as much as they want. Going one step farther, what do they do, though? <coughs> like, what are the laws they pass, maybe, or you're talking about, or corporations? Who's they? Uh, I don't know, I guess you mentioned, uh, you said the legislative branch or anybody else, people you elect. What are they doing then? What are they doing? Well, yeah. they're doing nothing. <laughs> That's true, but. Uh, yeah, well, they are. Yeah. I mean, they passed legislation Dodd-Frank. I guess what's their policy that but the, needs to change? Uh, to, what's the policy changes that need to be implemented? Well, if you had the opportunity to make policy changes, there have been some folks who've made recommendations. This guy named uh, Jim Rickards who wrote this really good book called The Currency Wars. He said you got to break up the big banks and you got to end derivatives trading. See, back in the 1930s we had a depression. We had, we had a period of reform. Well, they enacted all this like Glass-Steagall, as I mentioned earlier. But we get to the 90s, we offshore manufacturing and, and, and the high-tech sector, and so we're, we're doing finance. Okay? We're doing finance. So, so what is going to happen to all that? How's it going to ship back to an old, older economy? So you would have to get some sort of reform impulse from somewhere. Now, they, they talked a lot about it. They passed Dodd-Frank. They did a lot of but, but none of that's had any effect. As I said, you know, I, I agree with Paul Craig Roberts, what we have is really crony capitalism and a planned economy. I mean, markets, I mean, I could talk, sit here and talk about LIBOR manipulation, all kinds of market manipulation, algorithmic computer trading, all of this, everything some claim is manipulated, okay? And, and so you got this revolving door in government and, and the banking sector and corporations and what what are you gonna you know how do you end that you know particularly with it with the system that we have well you know we've got politicians running for office all the time and they need donations now they get rich even after they they're in office you know, so go ahead um, do you believe that part of the problem is not just these elect <coughs> these legislators that are getting elected through um, big donations and everything, but also the fact that the public se sector number of jobs is becoming, is coming closer to the private sector number of jobs in this country. Is that also contributing to... Actually, public sector jobs are declining. They are now. Mm -hmm. I mentioned that. 300,000 uh, teachers have lost their jobs in the last four years. Public sector employment is declining. At all levels, mm -hmm. federal, State and local. So, are you saying um, you're talking about a reform movement would have to be across the board? So, you don't think if we had, because the only time in American history we really had the breakup of big corporations was when 
Teddy Roosevelt was in office. So mm -hmm. are you saying we'd have to, if there were, we got a president there, that it couldn't happen then too? Well, you know, ideally speaking, you know, if you if you capture that in your mind, yeah. you have, that, that's, that's good, but then you have to think, okay, how do you get there? Yeah. Okay. And that was a different era. Yeah. So, and, and, and the big thing is, you have to remember, we're not the same country. We're not the same country we were after World War II, where you see that those growth rates. I, I talked about what are growth rates now compared to the decades following World War II when we had a strong manufacturing base. We don't have that anymore. Okay? We, have, we have finance dominance and you have the big service set. So, so yeah, we done? Yeah. Thanks for coming, folks. We're finished. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much.